Hi everybody, thanks for joining me again. Hi everybody, thanks for joining me again here with the uh, discussion with the Executive Director. I'm Matt Lotzenizer, Executive Director with the Historical Museum at Fort Missoula, and today I am joining you from our Heath Gallery exhibit, uh, which is entitled No Enemy Movement Observed, a, uh, the Vietnam War Through the Eyes of a French Town Marine. And one of the reasons I'm joining you today from this space is that we were just recently uh, given an award for this exhibit. Uh, we've been really proud of it. It opened about a year ago now and has gotten an overwhelmingly good response from the community. Uh, we reached out to the vets community as well too with it and it's just been a really well, well supported and wonderful exhibit for us here at the museum. Uh, it is in our Heath Gallery and for those of you who haven't been out to the museum or who only come right sometimes or not, not frequently, we do have uh, four different galleries here. We have an orientation gallery that we usually change out a couple times a year, usually three or four times a year. Uh, we have a north gallery, which is a space upstairs, and that's a smaller gallery, and we usually change that exhibit twice a year, um, or once or twice a year, and then uh, our Heath Gallery is an every two-year gallery, and that's the one we're in today, and this exhibit's been up for about a year and a half now, so we're kind of at the tail end of it, um, so it's been, uh, like I said, it's been inc incredibly well received, and then of course our final gallery is our permanent gallery, which is the story of Fort Missoula and the Historical Museum here. So, again, why I'm joining you here from our Heath Gallery is that we actually have been, uh, re we've received an award called the 2020 Leadership in History Award of Excellence, and it was specifically for our Vietnam exhibit here in the Heath Gallery. Now, the exhibit itself uh, tells the story of a local Marine by the name of Leon Howard. Uh, Leon described himself as your uh, basically qualified Marine after finishing through his um, his basic training and was sent off to Vietnam for 13 months. Leon was a 20 year old man at the time he went over. Uh, he saw and experienced some pretty difficult things while he was in Vietnam and his kind of carried those things with him and some of the challenges those things have created in his health and his mental health with him his entire life. So uh, as part of this exhibit Leon thought of us and he reached out to us and he shared a number of things that he brought back with him from Vietnam as well as he also was an amateur photographer, so he took a, quite a few photos, uh, and we've had some of those blown up. And it's interesting for an amateur photographer and a 20-year-old young man in the middle of a war, he had a really great eye and took some really spectacular photographs of his fellow soldiers as well as some of the people in Vietnam and some of the landscapes. So we're really pleased to be able to share Leon's photos and some of the artifacts he has. Um, some of the other things we do here with the exhibit, uh, we wanted to make it... Um, while it is just one man's story of Vietnam, we wanted to find a way to to allow people the opportunity to, to kind of come to grips and talk about the stories that they have from their own personal experiences in the same way that Leon has done his. Um, so we have hosted a whole number of public programming and things like that where we've invited other vets, Vietnam vets and folks to come in and talk about their experiences. Uh, we have a reflection wall where people can share how they feel about the exhibit, how the exhibit makes them feel. If they're veterans, they can talk about their experiences on that wall. And we've had a really great response to that with folks coming in and, um, and just sharing with us and about how this exhibit has moved them and, and made them feel and help them you know, relate to some of the struggles that our veterans go through. So it's been really, really well received. Um, one area that I, I think is especially interesting that our curator Ted Hughes came up with is in the middle of the exhibit there is a small kind of a reflection area but essentially that reflection area has a video of Leon's additional photographs it has a number of publications related to the Vietnam War um, but it also on the walls has kind of a a history of PTSD and some of the different terms it's been used over the years so Essentially, we know that the experiences that men and women go through during battle have long-lasting effects on them. Um, you think about back during World War I, it was referred to as shell shock. Um, and, you know, you hear many stories about uh, different veterans that experience this in different ways, but it's, it's a challenging uh, kind of change to their psyche that's brought about by these traumatic experiences they have. So what was interesting is when Ted started doing the research, he realized that you know, there are documented cases of PTSD all the way back to Greek and Roman times. Um, the 
essentially the general experience that people experience during war hasn't changed whether it was war fought on a battlefield with swords or war fought with drones today. So um, it's been really interesting to see and kind of um, in our sense we want to try to normalize that experience in the sense that we want people to, to understand that that's one of the costs we face when we send our folks to war uh, and we want people to be able to talk about these things and, and kind of help them to deal with some of the struggles they have and that's been the goal of it. Uh, in addition we also have a number of resources there for local veterans groups um, here in our community that people can reach out to those folks if they do need to talk a little bit further. So like I said it's been a really spectacular exhibit we've been really had to, happy to have it up here in the museum and um, you know thank you to Ted for all the work he did in putting it together uh, and thank you to the ASLH, the American Association of State and Local History, for a award of excellence that we received for the exhibit. So, good. It's great. It's it's really really nice to see that hard work that the staff has put in being rewarded with being recognized for the award. So the next thing I'd like to talk about today is the governor's update uh, about phase two. Uh, for those of you who have not run across it yet, the governor of Montana has announced that the state will move into phase two of reopening effective June first. I will tell you this is not going to affect our plans as far as opening here at the museum. We are still in the process of putting things in place um, as far as getting a hold of sanitizer and figuring out traffic patterns in the museum, um, proper physical distancing, and those type of things. So we're still getting our supplies and getting everything ready so that when we do open, we're doing so in a safe manner for our visitors and our staff and our volunteers. Uh, there are going to be some different rules. Uh, it's not going to be like it's been in the past where um, we just kind of wander in as many people as we want. Uh, we are going to limit about 10 individuals in the museum at any given time. Uh, we'll have kind of a, a start and go sign that's going to be outside. And um, if you get here and there's a red sign or a red stop sign, then we'll have you wait until we clear out the building and then we'll bring our next group in. So we, we hope that because we have such confined spaces inside the museum, by limiting the total number of people to only 10 people in the museum, it'll help us as far as um, kind of controlling those traffic patterns and, and giving people the, the opportunity to space out a little bit. Some of the other things you're going to see when you come here is we are going to ask that anyone that wants to come in the main museum to please wear a mask. Uh, of course, we're going to ask you to respect your physical distancing. We will have some markers on the floor that'll show you what six feet is. Um, and especially with things like the front desk and some of the traffic patterns in our exhibits, uh, you'll be able to do that. Uh, one other thing we're going to do that, we're, that we think is really important is we'd like to have a sign-in sheet. Uh, and the goal of this is not so we can collect your information and sell it to the dark web. Um, the goal of the sign-in sheet will simply be so that in the event that someone becomes ill that works here at the museum, or someone that visits the museum lets us know that they've taken ill after visiting, we would have essentially a contact list and we would be able to do our own version or turn over a list of contacts uh, to the, the city county health department so that they could reach out to those folks and let them know that they need to quarantine for a period of time. So we are going to try to do that so we can kind of maintain a list of folks for contact tracing. Uh, some of the other things we're doing, we are looking at getting some hand sanitizer units installed, um, several here in the main museum building and also several out on the grounds. Uh, and the intention there is to give people access to hand sanitizer so that they can uh, practice that and yeah so we want to make sure that you have access to it whether you have it with you or whatever you can use ours here at the museum finally we are I mentioned something about traffic patterns we are installing some arrows that are going to guide you through our galleries and the goal of that is to create one-way lanes uh, so that as people are walking through the galleries they know the direction that the gallery is set up to be read in or observed in but also so that we stop that back and forth contact between folks so people can kind of go in one direction uh, maybe some of you have visited um, the Tower of London in, in London and you get to go see the crown jewels and they literally put you on a conveyor belt uh, that goes in one direction and you continue to move as you go through. We're not going to put you on a conveyor belt, but we are going to put some arrows on the floor to show you the proper direction to go around and ask that you respect those arrows when you come out and visit through. So again, we're still in the process. We're doing a lot of that. I, I do have one other announcement. Um, we are looking at the possibility of accepting books again here. I know a lot of folks have asked about our annual book sale, when we're going to be able to potentially take books um, in for donation. We are looking at a tentative date right now, June 15th, to begin book donations. 
I will tell you, if you have books to donate, we are going to be doing that by appointment only. So um, what we will probably do, if, if you want to reach out to myself or call the museum and speak with somebody, set up a time to bring that donation out, we'll probably take them straight over to our storage area and try to limit the amount of contact and limit the amount of staff that actually has to handle the books. We'll then be quarantining those books for a period of time until we feel that they are safe to be sorted. Uh, so we will start taking books again, so start thinking of us as you do your, all your quarantine cleaning this year. Uh, but do make sure to call first and not just arrive with books, because if you do, we are not able to take them. Um, okay, so time for a history tidbit of the day. Uh, one of the things I've started to do is I've tried to tell you a little history tidbit. We learned a little bit last week about Eugene Ely. Uh, this week, I thought it was very fitting, especially because I'm sitting in our Vietnam exhibit and we're getting ready for Memorial Day weekend to maybe talk about a little bit about the history of Memorial Day and Decoration Day and when those things came about and how the ideas came. Um, so, and essentially, um, Memorial Day, or as it was called then, Decoration Day, was officially proclaimed uh, around May of 1868, and it was first organized, as I said, as De Decoration Day. And it got that name because the idea was that the folks would go out and decorate the, the graves of the loved ones they'd lost in the Civil War. So it was immediately after the Civil War in 1868. And that first official, pseudo-official celebration was actually held at Arlington National Cemetery and was organized by one of the former Civil War soldiers. Um, there were, that wasn't the actual first attempt at doing in a day, a day like this. There are many communities that were decorating graves and, and going out to the graveyard in commemoration or in memorial to folks that had passed away in the Civil War at an earlier time. A um, number of different cities claim the right to have had the first decoration or Memorial Day. Uh, some of those are Columbus, Mississippi. Uh, Columbus and Macon, Georgia both also make that claim. And in the north, it was Bullsburg, Pennsylvania, and Carbondale, Illinois, also claim the idea of being uh, the first site of a decoration type day celebration. Uh, in fact, there's actually about 25 different locations that claim that they had the first celebration of, uh, of a Memorial Day. Um, one of the reasons they chose the date in May the way they did, and it initially was, the idea was the original date was to be May 30th every year. And they chose it because by May 30th, during the 19th century, they could count on there being flowers available to take out to the graveyards. And so they didn't want to do it prior to that because of the lack of availability of fresh flowers. Uh, moving forward a little bit, in 1966, uh, President Lyndon Johnson actually kind of weighed in on this, and he determined that Waterloo, Waterloo New York was actually the birthplace of Memorial Day. Um, another interesting fact about our Memorial Day or Decoration Day, as it was known, is that up until the conclusion of World War I, the day was purely a commemoration of the soldiers that were killed during the Civil War. It was only after World War I that the kind of the language and the meaning of the day was changed to celebrate vets of all wars and not just uh, the Civil War. Um, so it was officially declared a national holiday. Excuse me, i got to look at my notes here. It was officially declared a national holiday by an act of Congress in 1971, uh, and that was when the decision was made to choose the final, um, the final Monday in May as officially being Memorial Day. So one of the things they've done in recent years, because as we all know, in addition to being um, a special time where we should be thinking about our vets and those that were lost in foreign wars and in, in wars on our soil, um, it's become kind of a, a barbecue day and a kickoff to summer. But one of the things they've done recently to try to bring that original meaning back to the day was that they've started what they call a national moment of remembrance. And the idea with this, and I think it's a great idea, would be to hold a kind of a moment of silence or a moment of remembrance on Memorial Day at 3 p.m. in the afternoon. And so it kind of brings our thinking back to what the origins of the holiday were. It's, it's not just a fun barbecue. It was meant for a reason to kind of remember that those that we'd lost in our wars. So, okay, so that's our little history, a brief, brief history of Memorial Day or Decoration Day as it was known. Uh, I did have a couple questions. Um, so my, my number one super fan, Christiana Ailson, uh, also our education director here, 
hit me with a couple questions on Facebook, so I wanted to kind of answer those quickly. Her first question uh, was, if I could fully fund a project with magic rather than grant requests, what would it be? So this is a really difficult question from Christiana because, you know, picking a project here at the Historical Museum is like picking which of my children I like best. Um, I mean, we have this amazing locomotive project that's underway. We have all the work we're doing to commemorate the, the Department of Justice camp here at Fort Missoula and the barrack restoration project. Um, gosh, we've got the money we're trying to raise right now to do some public programming around the new exhibit here in our Heath Gallery. Uh, we have a number of other buildings that we you know, have on our list that need restoration. So I'm going to take the easy way on, on this because she said the word magic. I'm going to say if I had money to fund one project with a museum, I would fund a time machine so that I could step back in time and we would be the first museum to actually have that. So not only could you learn about the past, you could go back and visit the past. So Christiana, that's what you get for including the word magic in the question. Uh, the second question she had for me was, uh, what is my favorite historical period? Um, it's interesting. I've always been fascinated by 19th century U.S. history. Um, the other area that I've read quite a bit in outside of, of U.S. history is uh, I love Tudor Stuart Britain. Uh, I love that whole period of the, say, the 16th and 17th century in Great Britain. It's always been fascinating to me. Um, I took a trip to London when I was at a very impressionable age in college, and and it kind of it got into me and made me really fascinated with all the history in that city. So I've been interested in those type of things as well, too. But yeah, for U.S. history, probably 19th century. But for uh, all history, I would have to say I love that, you know, the history of London and the history of the Tudor Stuart uh, period in British history. So, OK, if anyone else has questions, keep them coming. I'm going to continue to do these. Uh, although we are open in June 1st, we're anticipating continuing to do some Facebook Live events. Uh, I'm penciled in for at least the rest of this month, and then uh, we probably will continue them once we get into June. So again, thanks for taking a few minutes to tune in. Appreciate the time, and thank you as always for your support of the Historical Museum, and I wish everybody a very great Memorial Day weekend.